the name, which is nothing but a, a word, Christ life, the, the term Christ life, just a term, not, not intended to separate or divide, but to simply earmark what it is we are specifically doing, has uh, come to me as a idea whereby to give us a constant consciousness and awareness of who and what we are. A, an idea that says that uh, it isn't anything he has done, it isn't anything he's going to do, but who he is. For instance, uh, one of the important factors of this message is the fact that we have come to a union. And sometimes it's so easy to talk about union and not Jesus. But I was struck by the Holy Spirit yesterday and today that, that when you speak of Christ and his life, you're talking about union. The little hyphen we put between the two is the thing that says union, but the message is not union any more than the message is baptism or church or faith or prayer. A message is Christ. And that's where we've come in this walk that's, that's probably more uh, uh, separating from other believers than anything, and yet we don't do it on purpose. We have, we have come to where nothing else is really so important as Jesus. And I've said before, a uh, long time before, probably right in this institute, that, that in my walk I've gone through uh, various understandings in my past in, in the ministry that ate me up. That was it. That was the catalyzing force. Of course, when I was a Baptist, it was to get saved and get in the church and go to work. And then uh, as a charismatic, it was to get an experience, talk in tongues, and cast out devils. And as I look back over my experience, it was all necessary for me. It may not be necessary for you, but it was necessary for me to come that way because that's the only way God got my attention. But as I look back over it, none of it was Jesus. Now, I didn't have Jesus out of it. You couldn't do anything without talking about Jesus. But it wasn't Jesus. It was, it was getting people to do something. It was getting an experience. It was doing something for God in the name of Jesus. It was all Jesus. And that's what makes us so difficult to be understood at times. Because people say, well, aren't we preaching Jesus? That's the first thing a preacher is going to say to you when you say, well, I want to go to a church where they preach Christ. First thing he'll say, what do you think I'm preaching? And it took years in my walk of doing all these other things, using Jesus, using the Holy Spirit, using God, but not really seeing Christ as all. So that's what's really happening to us. If you, don't, if you don't understand the thing that may offend others, is the thing that you're not doing on purpose at all is by saying that it's all Christ. A lady wrote me one time, and she said, can't you talk about anything but Jesus? You'd think Jesus was all it was to talk about. And she was just as sincere. She's a good, born-again, spirit-filled, operating believer. But she couldn't see Jesus. And maybe you still have that difficulty. Maybe you have the difficulty that in seeing Jesus, you have it all, and only seeing him by what he does, you never have him all. If you had everything operating in you that Jesus could do, you would never have the all, the total, the fullness. Because the fullness is in a person. It's like understanding the scriptures. Until you see the difference between the scriptures and the word, 
You can't understand the Bible because he's the catalyzing factor. You can die for a baptism. Lots of people do. There are many people in religion that will die for their particular baptism because that's the catalyzing force that holds the whole thing together. If you get it, you're one with them. If you don't get it, you're not even saved. But that's still not Jesus. So you see, when we begin to talk about the Christ life, it isn't union, it isn't baptism, it isn't works, it isn't faith, it isn't prayer. Though all of those are important, they're not the center. They're not what we really are and what really makes all the rest of it work. That's Jesus. So that's been on my mind for the last few hours. We're beginning a new institute in Sacramento. And we had a uh, present at the embryonic meeting yesterday, a lady who is a theologian with Simpson School of the Bible, which is a theological school. And so she sat in the meeting and uh, God blessed her and she took it all in very well. And I was very pleased with her comments because God had led her this way, though she hasn't been a Christian very long. But uh, she had great difficulty with God. And so I spent a little time talking to her about her and answering her questions. And what it was that she couldn't understand about God is what we've talked about here called the dark side of God or the, the hurt love of God or the, the cross and the heart of God. Those three different terms we give to the same thing. Talking about a God that would take his only begotten son and kill him in order to get what he wanted. You see, we never look at God quite like that. We look at him as loving and wonderful and that, that he's really not anything like that. That's not like God at all. What he really is, is the epitome of our idealism. What we fashion God to be in our mind is really what he is. When he's not that at all, he's a person. He, he's, a, he's a sovereign person. That means he is his own person. He's not what you make him. He's not what you create him. And, and one thing that's happened to us in religion is that the doctrines which have been promoted by the religions that we've grown up through have been so adamant and so commanding and demanding that we were sure those doctrines made God to be that. When the simple facts are, he's his own person. And it doesn't hurt us to take a look at the fact that he has a thing in him that says that I want to pay a price. I want to give. I want to take what is most important to me and pour it out regardless of its hurt to me to get what I want. We don't look at God much like that. The way we really see God most of the time is that he's touched by the feeling of my infirmity and he knows I hurt right now and he ought to do something about it. Now that's really our concept of God. But the, the greater fact that we want to look into in, in this institute is how God took this part of himself and worked it out. We have a simple story we tell that Ephesians 1 and 4, one of our prime texts in the Christ life, says that according as he has chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world. We stop right there because that's the most loaded line in the whole Bible. Because what that says is that God caused you to come about in his mind before anything was created that's in the world. Now, we've mentioned this so many times, but we're ready now to deal with what is a fact of this idea. What is the real fact of it? Well, the fact of it is that our Heavenly Father fashions you in His mind before He ever created anything that is in the world. That's an important point. Another important point is that He had you fashioned in His mind, chosen, in Christ, not only you 
fashioned in his mind, but Christ as your life in his mind before there was ever a devil turned loose in his plan that would have to do with you and I. Before there was ever any evil in the universe, God had you fixed in his mind as to what you'd be chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Now that's the fact of this one little line out of Ephesians 1 and 4. Well, that has far-reaching consequences because what that really means, and incidentally, we're on page uh, 71 in our notes. What that really means is that God had you and I by his omniscience firmly fixed in his thinking as to who we would be, not particularly as to what we would do, but he had us chosen in Christ before anything in the world was created. So that means that the creation of the world and everything beyond the foundation of the world has to do with you becoming what it is you already are in Christ. Now we like to throw the idea of predestination election around and I've told you we won't even touch that except to say that what God did when he created this world was to fix it so that what was in his mind would ultimately take place. Now that's pretty important because you must see this. God cannot force you to be the chosen in Christ. He can't force you to be that. He has never forced you to be that. In fact, when he created you, he created you to be a creature of choice so that you would make a choice. And if you made that choice for him in your crisis moment, choosing his salvation and his way, then it would all fit together. If you didn't choose him, then nothing in this world ever would matter. Now that's what was in his thinking, I believe. We see that simply from John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Those are the words. Nothing in the universe would ever work for you except you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. So what he did, he had you fashioned and fixed in his mind in Christ. And then he put together the framework that would bring you to that understanding. Now, can we start with that point? Can you get that in your mind? Oh, I've said it so many times. If you really knew that factor, you'd never be run over by this world or the things that happen in it. Why? You preclude it. You are before the world. You are in God's mind. The world was strictly an afterthought of God to bring about what it is he wants. It was not his main thought. His main thought was you. His main thought was that he would take a part of himself, God the Son, and put it in you. That was his plan. So that finally he would get his house filled with sons that were likened unto himself. But to bring that about, he knew that he must create a contrasting environment. Because the simplicity of the plan of God is there must be a contrast before there can be a choice. And there must be a choice before there can be love. So what he did in creation was to make a contrasting environment. Now somehow in our 
past, I think most of us got the idea that everything in the world was just perfect in Eden. There was no bad, there was no wrong, there was no evil, there certainly was no sin. And so we always think in our weaker moments, my, I wish we had Eden on earth again. You couldn't be any more mistaken than several times that God looked at his creation and said it was good didn't mean that it was our kind of good because my kind of good is the absence of bad. <laughs> his kind of good is the fulfillment of his sovereignty, his person. When he looked at the heavens and the earth that he had created and the separations he had made and what he had brought forth by the spoken word and said it is good, what it did, it fitted what it is he's doing. That's good. That's good. I've always heard men say, well, there was no bad in the garden that the roses didn't have thorns and the water didn't have uh, acid in it or whatever it is the environmentalists are worried about now. Everything was nice. But it isn't like that. When he said it is good, it fit what it was it was created to do. Because you see, in that garden was the best looking creature, but it was the devil. In that garden was the best-looking tree, but it was an evil tree, not within itself, but it was God who created the premise for evil that would be the foundation for sin. He had to put that in there because the world, to be good to God, had to fit all of these particulars that it would bring forth the purpose of creation. And the purpose of creation is to have a framework that brings the creature to the ultimate intent of God, chosen in Christ. Well, now, I've said some real explosive things. If anybody believed them, they'd be mad or jumping up and down, whichever. A scientist said, to me not long ago, he said, if the science of the world believed what you were saying, they'd have an answer to everything. Well, that makes me smarter than them. I got an answer to everything. I know why the world was made. I know that it was made good and turned bad. I know that it was made to succeed God's purpose. That's why he said it was good because it's what he needed to get what he wanted in love. God never created sin. We've said this many times, but he did create evil. Prophet said that twice of it. What is evil? Evil is that tree sitting there that was so pretty, but had forbidden fruit on it. And an enticement came from the creature toward that very tree. Why did God do that? He must do that because that's like he is. He's not evil, but to get us to come to see who and what he is by the giving of the lamb that he had slain in his mind, we needed that contrast. So the creation of the world becomes a very important factor. You understand the world? It's here today and gone tomorrow. It's just that you and I are so wrapped up in this world, life, earth, our own environment, that sometimes we forget who and what we are. Who am I? I am a chosen creature in Christ that preempts the world. Because I was chosen in Christ before the world began, and once I became in Christ, I was eternal, and I 
go beyond the world. It'll be thrown away. It's plastic. It won't stay. Heaven and earth both shall pass away. So what we want to do now is to discuss what I think is one of the most important subjects of the Institute. This Institute and the next one. We will be taken up with this one subject. This one subject all comes under the heading of a simple statement. The making of a son. Wonderful to be birthed. Glorious to be born again. But it's very obvious that's not the whole intent of God. To get a house full of rascals doing their own thing is the last thing a father wants. What he would like is sons likened unto his only begotten son because he gave that son's life to them. He gave that son's word to them. He gave that son's nature to them. He gave that son's spirit to them. He wants sons likened unto his only begotten son. The key word, which we discussed some when we were in Romans 8, is adoption. I think there's an H in there. Isn't there? No H in there. I got it right, Al, thank you. Adoption. That's what adoption is. Not enough to be birthed, but by being in the same old body with a new nature in you requires a breaking of ideas in order for that new nature to work through this old body. That's why you can talk about being one with Christ all you want to, but it's in the head until that breaking comes and you know the difference between knowing who I am and me living out who I am. Why are we in this world? Lots of times I've been angry with God and the thing I said to him in my anger was, Why'd I have to stay here? Did you ever feel like it'd be better to go than it is to stay? I mean, have you ever been in such a place that you'd rather go be with the Lord than to face the issue at hand? I don't mean to die. I'm not particularly eager to die in some awful way, but I've got it fixed in my mind. I'd just like to go be with the Lord. Here stands all my troubles and here am I. I'd like to just jump over them and go instant. I'd like to go be with the Lord. We've all had that pull at various times. I'd like to get out of it. But the world is a created place by God with such a distinctive purpose to it that we need to come to see its purpose. Its purpose has to do with adoption. Its purpose has to do with the making of a son. Our other institutes that are already gone into advance or second term institutes I always have some bright fella in it that never uses my term the making of a son. Uh, in fact, Rob Walters is always throwing at me, it's not the making of a son, it's the breaking of a son. You got it wrong. Why do I make a stress of the making of a son? It's because the scripture uses that term to go beyond the birthing. If all God wanted to do was to get people born again and fill up his house with them, there'd be no purpose for us staying in this world. I used to say that the best eternal security there is, is the moment you get saved, God hits you in the head <laughs> and you go on to glory. Now that's eternal security indeed. <laughs> but the facts are, it needs to be worked out.
because you don't know that security and you don't understand what God is doing until it begins to work in you. So the world is created to bring about the process of adoption. How it is you're going to be made a son. I don't know that I had you mark these scriptures previously or not, but you remember a verse that says, Christ made of a woman, made flesh, made under the law, made lower than the angels. I don't suppose I had you to mark those scriptures, but if you'd look very closely, this word is the key in every one of those. He was birthed by Almighty God in the Virgin Mary as God the Son. But God saw the necessity of making him certain things. Well, that's important. We know that as further identification because if he hadn't been made those things, you and I would have never had identification with him. Here comes Jesus, so smart, so pure, so holy, so sinless that he just knew right off certain things. I was noticing on TV, somebody's offering a book, at least down in California, a commercial on the lost years of Jesus. <laughs> because it's always been intriguing to mankind about Jesus of Nazareth. But you know what? He was born just like your baby was born. And when he was born, he didn't have a bit more sense than your little baby had. You say, what's the difference? Not a bit of difference. Made of a woman, just like you were. Well, he was so smart, he didn't have to succumb to all the religion around. Scripture said he was made under the law. Isn't that interesting? I'll talk one day about how Jesus conformed to the religion around him because he was made under the law, and he taught the law, and he knew that the law had no answers to mankind. But God made him in this world subject to that. That's important. Just like every one of us are subject first to the law before we can ever come to know Christ. You weren't born again with an idea of freedom and liberty. You were born again and immediately came under some law. Somebody said to me the other day, said, now it'd be wonderful. Everybody gets born again, just step right into their liberty and union. I doubt it. Because I don't think they'll know what that is until they have the law working. Because there's a thing that little babies have to learn. And that's in the contrast to know the opposite. You don't just holler at them saying, I don't do that anymore. They have to learn. That's why Paul said to the, to the church at Ephesus, uh, chapter 3, you haven't learned Christ anymore. You don't know this Jesus that's in you like you ought to. You wouldn't be living like you live. He said that to believers. They haven't learned Christ. So we, we have to go through that process. Learning very often comes by law. Somebody says, don't do this, don't do that. And you have to learn by that. Besides, that's your school teacher that brings you to Christ. So you can't escape it. He was made under the law. He was made flesh. That is, in the same kind of body you are. I know a lot of people throw the word flesh around. They ought to be careful. You ought to define it properly because uh, uh, Paul was destined to say later on, uh, what is it, Galatians 2 and 20, that the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the Son of God. I live by the faith of the Son of God. This life I live in the flesh. So he had to be made flesh. We kind of get an idea that what we call the lost years of Jesus uh, was where he was running around doing all sorts of miracles and nobody recorded it. In fact, I read a little bit of the Book of Mary one time. I don't know whether you ever read the Book of Mary. That's, uh, is, it, it, is, it, is it in the Catholic Bible? 
Anyhow, I had a book of all these lost books one time. And I tell you, it was an adventure. Uh, reading, Jesus was healing the sick when he was 18 months old. And, <laughs> and wherever he walked, people were uh, stepping in his uh, first steps and getting all kinds of deliverances. It's unbelievable. But you know what? Jesus came into the world just like anybody else, and he had to go through all of these processes. The difference with him is he didn't sin. He didn't sin. So the Holy Spirit had perfect liberty to teach him. For instance, Jesus didn't go to school. His parents couldn't afford schooling. You had to pay for schooling in his day. Unless the synagogue had a, a Sabbath school, he never went to even a semblance of school. Like that would be Sunday school. Maybe they had a Sunday school class. Maybe the, the rabbis taught something on Saturday morning and the, to the little children. That'd be the only kind of teaching he ever had. Where this teaching come? Came from the Holy Spirit. That's how he taught him. And so as Jesus grew in all ways that we do, the scripture says, he finally came to the knowing that God's intent and purpose was being fulfilled but he still limited himself to be what it was he had come to be. What do I mean by that? I think he knew that he would be the life of men. I think he knew that when he gave us uh, the words in the 15th chapter of John, I am the vine, you are the branches. I think he knew that uh, when he said, whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, the same shall save. I think he knew he would be the life of men. But it wasn't his place to say that. He stayed under subjection. That's a part of his kenosis, his self-limitation to who and what he was. But all the way through the record, especially when Paul speaks of it in the epistles, he speaks of what Jesus was made. Now, nobody can make you a Christian. That comes by birthing. But we're beyond that point now. We're looking at what it is that's in God's intent by this world. If his only purpose was to get us saved so we didn't go to hell, then he's very cruel to leave us in this world. So what's the purpose of the world? Where does it come in? Well, our point so far is that the world comes in after I'm planned and chosen to be in Christ. So now I have to fix what this world is all about to my understanding. And it isn't very difficult to do that. In fact, a beautiful thing happens in Colossians. And so I want you to turn to Colossians chapter 1. I want you to see what God had in mind with creation. In Colossians 1, beginning to read at verse uh, 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, I want to pause there for a minute because I was going to town yesterday, so to speak, and uh, talking down in California, and I was overwhelmed once again with this kingdom business. And I wish we had a whole lot more teaching on it because it's all out of bounds today in the, particularly the, uh, the fundamental and charismatic church world. But you remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus when he first met him? He said, you must be born again or you cannot even see the kingdom of God. Well, here 
Paul refers to this kingdom again. He says that we have all been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, see, that doesn't have anything to do with Israel. That doesn't have anything to do with Abraham or David or Moses. That doesn't have anything to do with the law. What that's saying is that there is in Christ a full and total operating kingdom. Now, what we really have in our minds as Christians is that the world is really the place where we're looking for God to operate. We see the world with its problems, its trials, its enemies, Satan, its ups and its downs, and if Christianity is anything at all, work in this world. But there's something we fail to see, and that is when Jesus becomes your life, you are translated into another kingdom, which kingdom is not this world made better, but him. That's what Jesus had in mind. Most remarkable thing Jesus said to the Christ life was probably what he said to Nicodemus, that until you're born again, you cannot even see the kingdom of God. So he put the new birth in its right place and said that the kingdom of God is something you can't see till you have this other person birthed in you, Christ in you. Then you'll see the kingdom. Well, the problem is multitudes of believers see that the world is a place that God has to straighten out. They don't see that they're in a kingdom called Christ. Now, I'm going to tell you why that's so important, our brother Paul is. Read on here. We've been translated in the kingdom of Jesus in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, lordship, lordship statements. You know what lordship is? Total everything. Jesus is not a part of it, not working to work it out. He's total everything. Do you have that in your mind yet? I got a little book on it over there. Total everything. You understand what that means? That doesn't mean Jesus is working through your problem. Jesus is total everything. That problem is not separate from Christ. You see, you thought you got saved and God's leaving you here in this world to use Jesus to work it out. But the fact is you've been translated into a kingdom called Christ. It's Christ in you. The kingdom is now within you. A whole government resides within you that rules and operates in this world perfectly to the glory of God. <coughs> I'm getting all stirred up over it. <coughs> Verse 15, Lordship statement. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now, mark this, for by Christ, were all things created. Things in heaven, things in earth, visible things, invisible things. Whether they be thrones or dominions or devils, principalities and powers, Satan, evil powers, all things were created by him and for him. Now that's revolutionary. First verse in the Bible, Genesis 1 and 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, it's not defined there. Why isn't it defined? Because the revelation has not yet taken place. We must have revealed Ephesians 1 and 4, first line, chosen in Christ. We must have a revelation of that. Because you can't understand it till the revelation comes. What does that mean? That means that until God reveals it to you, you can never understand even creation. Now, once the revelation that we're chosen in Christ is revealed, God can bring out what creation is all about. Bible students, always remember, you never understand the Bible except 
the new explains the old. You must first know the epistles before you can understand the four gospels. You must know the four gospels before you can understand anything in the Old Testament. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's not explained. Not until God gave it to Paul in the first chapter of Ephesians. Not, that's not the first place it's given. We'll look at another place. But the revelation must come before it's understood. Notice what he says. For by Christ were all things created. Last line, verse 16. All things were created by him and for him. Verse 17. He is before all things and by him all things consist, hold together. Now, what's the purpose of this world? It has to do with Jesus Christ. Everything in the universe has to do with Jesus Christ. Everything that's been created, all things. I've searched out all things. I had a brother to make me so disgusted one day, I got uh, commentary down and searched out every all things in the New Testament. Because he said something about it I didn't believe, and I searched it out. And sure enough, all things means exactly what it says, all things. I had a faith preacher who said to me one time on Romans 8 and 28, where it says all things work together for the good. He said that only means all things you believe. It's only what you believe works. That's dumb. If I only got from God what I believe for, I wouldn't even be here tonight. <laughs> and I'm the same thing about negative. One fellow said, well, if you have negative thoughts, that's what you'll be. God knows I'd be awful if I went by my negative thoughts. I have a lot of them. But I've got something good to report to you. Not all my negative thoughts work, and not all my beliefs work. But it all balances out. So don't get hung up on confession. Because you're going to confess a lot of things that don't work, and you're going to not say a word about a lot of things that do work. Because it's not you that works in him. It's him that works in and by you. Notice now. Everything in creation, all things, had to do with Jesus Christ. Well, we haven't been taught this. In our adventure of religion, uh, starting out maybe as a Catholic and moving to Baptist and then moving to Presbyterian and then moving to Charismatic and now whatnot, <laughs> in that adventure, there's no telling what you believed about creation. But you didn't see Jesus. That's why I said in introduction, it's hard to see Jesus. It's a whole lot easier to see something about him. For instance, I've caught myself when writing, wanting to talk about union because that's what everybody needs. But the Spirit has jerked me back. The message which we have seen and heard is not union. It's of him. He, he himself. That's what John got it all settled to. It's he. It's him. Why? Because everything that has been created has to do with him. It has to do with him. There's not an event that takes place that doesn't have to do with him. Daniel, what's that guy's name in Russia now? They're all arguing over him. Whole world stopped till we get something done about that fellow named <laughs> Daniel. And I thought as I watched the news, I thought, there you are, Jesus, trying to show forth again. But we're not seeing Jesus. You say, Jesus have anything to do with that? has all to do with it. Down to the kinky hair you can't get in place. 
all things. And that's hard to take. But you see, you weren't chosen to try to figure out the world or to be a politician or to be a sociologist or even a psychologist. You were chosen in Christ before the world was created. So the purpose of the world is to help you come to know who you are in Christ. You have been translated into that kingdom where everything has to do with Jesus. Now, I'm going to be real honest with you. Believe it or not, I can be real honest. We don't have much theology for this. We don't even have many books written on it. In fact, the books that are written on it, you wouldn't buy because you'd think the guy was faithless because he'd be telling you, bear up in your problems. Don't worry about all your little problems. They'll come and they'll go. What you want is to get the book that says explosive faith. Get your miracle today. In fact, get one every day. <laughs> you don't want to know about what God's doing. You want alleviation. <laughs> you don't want an understanding that lion's dens are more important to God than shutting them down. That fire furnaces are a greater opportunity for God than putting fires out by faith and miracles. You don't want to know about that. That's because we've all been tricked about this world. We're set to straighten it out. Everything we do is to straighten out our world some. Every little detail. That's all right if you saw Jesus in it. All things were made by him and for him. Now, can you swallow that? I know. It's hard to do. That's hard to do. I know you don't want to do that. But that's our starting place. Every time you read all things, catch all term. Paul's bad about it. Once he saw Jesus, that's all he could say. I see him everywhere. I see him in everything. I see now why the world's here. I see why I'm in it. I see by who I am what God's doing in this universe. All things. All things. That's his catch-all term. I counted one time. How many times it was used, and I forgot it. <laughs> but it's a catch-all term. I'm big on weight of scriptures. There's a heavy weight of scripture for all things. But it's there. And that's where you've got to start with the understanding of this world. Don't get lost to trees in the garden. They're only important if you see the purpose of creation. A little woman yesterday kind of wanted to argue with me over did God know they were going to sin? Did he fix it so they were going to sin? Did he make them sin? We were seeing everything but Jesus. In fact, all we were seeing was sin. You've got to start with where you begin if you're going to fit in this world. Where'd you begin? In God's mind, he planned you. He focused you. He chose you to be in Christ. You're finding out you can be a Baptist and not be there. You can be Pentecostal and not be there. You can be a Methodist and not be there. So you're finding out now in this world who you are. Who am I? I'm a chosen person in Christ. And the purpose of this world is to teach me that. Mark these lines heavily in Colossians 1. Because that who that's mentioned there is who you are. That's you. That's who you're one with. Next time the day is dark and the boat's on the stormy sea and you're hurt and you don't see any way out 
instead of grabbing a promise box and plucking out some wonderful promise, and they are wonderful, turn to Colossians 1 and hear Paul to whom God gave the revelation of how Christ gets in us and who we are by that Christ. Hear him say, everything in your life was made by Christ and for Christ. And if you knew who you were, Christ, in your human form, Christ in your vessel, you branch attached to his vine. If you knew that, this thing in the world would only be pushing you to who you are. It wouldn't be separating you. That's the key. We got it fixed in our mind that this world is set to separate us. We got it fixed that the devil set to separate us. We've got so much negative input in us about the world that every time God allows circumstances and situations to come into our world, we see the devil more than we see Jesus. We look for a miracle more than we see plainly what the scriptures have to say. I'm not telling you there's not a devil. Oh, there's not bad in the world. But it wouldn't be half as bad if you saw Jesus had to do with it. Yes. That it has purpose. That it has plan. That it's not out of order. Death is never out of order. Hurt and pain are never out of order. That's nature of God. That's what this adoption's all about. He doesn't want a bunch of Rascals, I call them, coming up and sitting at his table that have no feeling for who he is or know who he is by that son who shed his blood and gave his life. He doesn't want us ignorant of that. So if we think this world is separated from Jesus by the things that happen to us, we're ignorant because the things that happen in this world have to do with Jesus, us coming to know him. We've let the things in the world separate us from the Christ that is within us instead of bind us to the Christ that's in us. That's why he says these things here. These lordship statements are said in every epistle. The first three chapters of every epistle, I believe, except Romans, gives lordship statements that say the same thing that he's total everything. He's total everything. Why? That's who he planned you to be, is by that Christ, a Christian. So he's total everything. Jesus is not the evil that's in the world, but he has to do with it. He's not communism, but he has to do with it. He's not the hurt and pain in your body, but he has to do with it. And if you saw that by everything that's taking place in your little world, that it was made by him, and for him, that it was not made by the devil for you to get scalded and warped and whipped, but it was made by him and for him, and that all things consist because of him. What does that mean? That's union. When you see Jesus as your life, that life is fed by him ruling and reigning over everything you touch. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to convert the devil. I just had a fellow to send me a pamphlet on that this last week. <laughs> From over in Arkansas, lots of things in Arkansas. <laughs> and he has the devil finally converted. I don't really want to see that. But if he has faith for it, so be it. You're not going to change the world, but you're going to fit into it. You know about this fitting. You've had some experiences already where as a Christ person you fit. One of our ladies in uh, Houston Institute bore witness uh, last institute that I've had the death of three relatives this past month. She's 70 herself. The death of three relatives. 
And she said, for the first time in my life, I stood at the grave and gloried. Said, I loved them dearly, but said, I didn't shed a tear. I didn't hurt. And I saw their home going in such a way that it was Jesus. While all the rest of them were bawling and crying and upset. She said, for the first time, the Christ life began to flow like a river. And she said, death is no longer an enemy. All things have to do with him. We're stepping into this kind of world. This is what God is doing by the world, making sons likened unto his only begotten son. When John, first chapter, you probably ought to mark what he says too. John's gospel, first chapter. God gave him a vision of this lordship and total everything likewise. This is before the revelation had come chronologically. But John wrote his epistle many, many years after the revelation had come. In the beginning was the Word, John 1 and 1. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Christ, and without Christ was not anything that was made. In Christ was life, and the life was the light of men. How many times have you read that? Well, did you hear what he said? This world was made, created, fashioned, and operates by the Word of God. When you have that word away in your heart, your mind, you're going to have union in life. When you become one with yourself, Christ in you, you'll find that everything in the universe converges on that one thought. Because God never planned that we be separated by the world from the Jesus that's in us. But his plan was that we would even see Christ by all things that are created. We're ready to take a step and a greater adventure. And we'll take a break right now and come back to it.